Namo tassa bhado ato arahato summa sundurasa. Namo tassa bhado ato arahato summa sundurasa. Guram dhamman sangam namasami. So people can continue to meditate if they want or listen to the talk. They're one and the same in our tradition. The last two weeks we've been going through what we refer to as the hindrances. In Buddhism, there are three root defilements or asavas, which are, oh, sorry, kilesa, which um, are the roots of suffering in all unwholesome states. And these are delusion, uh, greed, and hatred. And greed and hatred are considered the two arms of delusion, in the words of Ajahn Panyavado. But these three roots manifest concretely in our lives and in our meditations in very, a very specific set of five uh, forms called the hindrances. And the Buddha spoke about these five as uh, very practical and tangible, so to speak, ways of looking at our experience and specifically looking at what keeps the mind from calm and peace. So the five are uh, greed, or sorry, sensual desire, kamachanda, which he compared to a bowl of water mixed with color so that one could not see one's face and also compared to uh, a person in debt. The second was vayapada or aversion which the Buddha compared to a bowl of water heated over a flame so that it bubbled and the surface was troubled and you could not see one's face and also sacred texts long known to one would still remain unclear. He also compared it to a sickness such that one when overcome with ill will uh, would not enjoy their food and would have no strength in their body. The third he compared, uh, he said was tinanita or sloth and torpor and he compared this to a bowl of water covered with algae and water plants so that the top was uh, completely uh, blanketed by this sort of turbid haze. And he also compared it to being in a dungeon, dark, unable to leave. The fourth hindrance the Buddha said was udacha kukucha, or restlessness and remorse. And he compared this to a bowl of water ruffled by the wind so that the surface troubled would not reveal one's face and sacred texts long known to one would not be clear. He also compared it to slavery, to being uh, subject to another and, un and unable to go or do what one wished. The, four, the fifth, he said, was vichy gicha or doubt. And this he compared to a bowl of water set in a closet, troubled, uh, so that the, tr the surface was um, moved and wavy, and one could not see one's face. And sacred texts long known to one would not be clear. He also compared doubt to being in a caravan traveling through a uh, bandit-infested wilderness. And the clear mind, the mind free of the hindrances, the Buddha compared to a bowl of water, limpid, clear, so that one could see one's face. And sacred words and texts, even one had just encountered, would be clear. And he compared it to freedom from debt, freedom from sickness, freedom from the dungeon, freedom from slavery, uh, safe passage and arrival at refuge. 
So the last two weeks, we moved through the first two of these, uh, sensual desire and aversion. And today we are going to approach the latter three, sloth and drowsiness, restlessness and remorse, and doubt. But I feel it might be worth really quickly uh, retreating back for a second to aversion or ill will, seeing as we have a, a certain guest in our meditation this morning, which is the flagpole up there and the chain, which has been uh, especially uh, instructive this morning. So first of all, we will probably be talking to St. Mark's about our Amistad School and seeing what can be done. But I think it's also uh, worth seeing that, seeing how we react to something so simple, the slight intrusion of a sound in our meditation can be very fruitful. Um, to watch how we uh, feel like it's taking us away from what we should be doing um, how we begin to personify it as this other, this thing that has come to disrupt us. And some of the techniques we talked about for working with aversion in these previous talks are relevant for something so simple because the same patterns and approaches we use for these simple basic things in our lives and our meditations are exactly the techniques and insights which are relevant for moving into the greater world. So one of the techniques we talked about was uh, looking at the source of aversion as a teacher. And with uh, intrusive sounds, I find this is especially helpful, is if one imagines that one has a certain technique or center of meditation one wants to get to and there's a distraction, it really is a source of annoyance constantly, constantly drawing you away from what you should be coming to or feel you should be. But if instead it is taken as part of your meditation, if you really bring it in as a, an object, then it can become a reminder to call oneself back to mindfulness. So for example, with the sound of the flagpole chain, one can uh, imagine that each sort of clink of metal upon metal is a uh, you know monk or nun um, ringing a, a bell again and again to kind of keep you aware. And in Zen circles, you'll notice that if people start to, um, or certain Zen circles, if you start to nod off, someone will come up behind you with like this big wooden sword and actually just slap you on the back. So, so there's your wooden sword if you want it. And, you know, Ajahn Chah was famous for saying, why are you going out and bothering the sound? The sound is just doing what sounds do. You know, it's not coming to bother you. You're going to bother it. But for better or for worse, it's there. Um, and inviting it in, acknowledging it can be helpful. And just bring it as part of your meditation. This is the first noble truth, is that when you turn towards something that is a source of suffering, often you find it opening up into the path. So, yes, your breath is a meditation object, but can you hold that in tandem with a gentle reminder um, of the flagpole chain on the flagpole to come back again and again to that mindfulness? The other is to, uh, as Ajahn Amaro sort of noted, if you really get something stuck in your head, uh, as like the one thing keeping you from happiness, just say the fantasy to yourself very slowly and see if you can keep a straight face. If this sound were not there, I would be happy forever. Just say it slowly and see how it looks. And also take joy in being part of a, a project where we're kind of MacGyvering things together from the ground up. It's kind of fun. So when looking at the other hindrances, uh, I think a useful ethic is one of play. And I spoke about this before, how when MRIs, they do note two kinds of mental consciousness, a spotlight awareness, which is focused on one object, and a lantern awareness, which is broad and allowing for all conditions to come in. But a third sort of 
brain wave uh, pattern was revealed in the concept of play awareness. Uh, so when people were in a playful state or working with a sort of play awareness, their mind was in a much different way of engaging. And this play awareness is an appropriate uh, approach to meditation, at least in, in some cases. It's also useful to think about with the hindrances because with AI intelligence, uh, you know, one of the things they were trying to do initially was set out a set of functions which uh, a machine would approach a problem with. And it was extremely uh, rigid in that any switch in the environment or the stimulus would throw off the machine learning. But the great breakthrough in AI came when you began to make the AI play against itself and uh, make sure it didn't get into ruts. Um, so it would create new strategies and begin to be, well, basically playful. And this is the approach we have to take with meditation because the hindrances have all of our intelligence behind them and much of our will. Um, they are us, just the part of us which doesn't necessarily wish for our immediate well-being. And whenever you find a sort of valid approach to meditation, and I think we've all had this experience, you'll find a good phrase of metta or a technique. And um, after a few days or weeks or sessions, you'll find that it just doesn't work again. My meditation journals were just filled with these phrases of like, I figured it out. And then, ah, oh. <laughs> I figured it out. Oh. <laughs> and so as the defilements and the hindrances adapt, we also have to adapt, and that takes an ethic of play. And to do this, we need a, uh, a tool belt to sort of react to the hindrances as they arise. So this is where it can get fun, is with this third hindrance of sloth and torpor, um, the Buddha compared it to uh, this bowl of water covered with algae or to being in a dungeon. And when the Buddha spoke about confronting or working with hindrances, he spoke about working with them in terms of what we call the gratification triad um, or pentad in certain cases, which is seeing the draw of something, why it's attractive, the drawback, what it does to us and the escape from it. So with something like sloth and torpor, it's really helpful to see what exactly is attractive about that hindrance. Why do we keep going to it? Because there's a reason. Um, and if you look at sort of that feeling, not necessarily just of sleepiness, but of a staleness in one's life, there's a, a great Ajahn Chah metaphor where he says the mind should be like a still forest pool. And it's very good to note when that's becoming a stale forest pool, because it does. And what he compared the bright, enlightened, uh, aware mind to was uh, stillness flowing. How when you look at a stream, the water is moving quickly, but it's so fluid that it looks absolutely clear and still at the same time. So with that stale feeling, there is something comforting about it. You know, the sort of algae uh, encrusted water or that feeling of being in a dungeon. Um, it's comfortable, it's known, it's not intimidating, it's small. And similarly, often with uh, sloth and torpor, with drowsiness, there's a desire to not, to not be, vibhava tanha, the craving not to become in that when there's an aversive, difficult thing coming up or something we don't want to deal with, um, you might notice if your main coping mechanism is to shut off. So that's good to know. Why do we keep going to these? And in one's daily life, there's a, a lot of very practical means of working with sloth and torpor. Um, so one thing is a common tradition in uh, monastic circles is a uh, determination you set that as soon as you're going to, as you wake up, you're going to get up. Um, I believe the phrase Longpore Sumedha uses is jump up with alacrity. And uh, I actually, monks will take on this, and nuns will take on this determination to sort of uh, do this. So you go to bed and you say, okay, the moment I wake up, I'll, I'll get up. 
Um, and I once took that Aditon, uh, that determination for a, a three-month Ponsa, Rains Retreat, but I didn't set a minimum time limit. So I kept like going to bed for 10 minutes and then waking up. And then I just have to like lean against the wall for the rest of the night and sort of dra doze off, which worked well enough. But, but the, the essence of it is a, a really useful practice. And it avoids that whole debate of when you wake up um, sort of being like, oh, another five minutes wouldn't hurt. You know, I need to be easy on myself. Um, Long Course Tomato said that when it comes to waking up, don't let wisdom anywhere near it. Waking up is an act of faith. So keep wisdom away from that. Just wake up and get up. And then if you need to go to bed later, a half an hour later, and take another nap, you can. Uh, but this can be a really useful way of bringing in energy. Another useful uh, technique is uh, to immediately jump into a cold shower or a snowbank if you got one around. Uh, during the early days of uh, Amravati, the community was really down and the whole atmosphere was sort of dark and depressed. And Long Force Tomato made a rule where the first thing all the monks did when they woke up was to take a cold shower and it turned the whole atmosphere around. So it can be helpful. Another useful thing to remember is that the counterpoint to uh, each hindrance is paired with a samadhi factor or a, a factor of the calm mind. And the factor that is the antidote to sleepiness and sloth and torpor is uh, vitaka, directed thought. So that's uh, directing one's mind in a wholesome way. And the Buddha gave a few ways of directing one's mind uh, in this way. One is to bring up faith. So to really bring up the recollection of those beings we've met who have inspired this brightness of heart in us, to bring up the teachers we've known, to bring up what this path has meant to us, a sort of brightness of light or a brightness of heart. And there's uh, monks who whenever they thought of Ajahn Chah would uh, just burst, they couldn't do it without tears running down their face. The next means is to, and these are all commentarial antidotes to sloth and torpor, is to recollect the preciousness of this human rebirth. How in a Buddhist uh, worldview, we've wandered for ages through a landscape that is dangerous, and bear often of real happiness. The Buddha compares the likelihood of a being in the lower realms ascending to a human rebirth to the likelihood of a uh, blind turtle in the ocean um, that comes up every thousand years and randomly sticks its head up somewhere in that ocean, um, happening out of complete coincidence to stick its head up through a wooden ring the size of one's uh, hand or forearm. doesn't really matter. And this is how rare it is to be reborn as a human. Then to be reborn as a human with interest in the Dhamma at a time when the Dhamma is taught with the real ability to practice. It's such an unbelievably precious opportunity. How can we waste it even for a second? And if one doesn't believe in rebirth, that's fine. But one can still recollect that out of all the beings in the world, um, those who have this circumstance, um, these, uh, this place to live, this stable society, and these teachings are so few. And it is not only our privilege um, and our great good fortune to come into contact and be able to practice those teachings, but it is our duty as well, having encountered such wisdom to embody, cultivate, and carry it forward for others. And the third uh, antidote the commentaries recommend is the perception of light. So bringing in this perception of bright daylight uh, into, the, into the mind. And the meditation that was guided this morning 
where one consciously breathed in uh, a visualized white mist into the head and allowed the mind to rest in the pineal gland, the middle of the brain, until a white light began to, to grow. This is a really common um, way of bringing up the light nimitta, the sign of light. And if one does that, one can, um, and this may happen when the mind is calm, uh, you might begin to see this sort of brightening of the whole visual landscape, and one can really foreground that light and keep the breath as an anchor in the back. The sound of silence is also, uh, which is a subtle hissing or ringing right below the auditory landscape, is the auditory equivalent of the perception of light and can also really crisp, uh, crisp the mind and make it wake up. The Buddha also recommended, uh, there's a sutta where Mahamogalana, one of the chief disciples, is nodding off. And he's sort of nodding, and then the Buddha manifests in front of him, which would be terrifying if you were just meditating and just <laughs> your teacher just sort of came out of nowhere. Uh, not terrifying, but I think it, it would make you stay on your game. Um, and he said, Mahamogalana, are you, are you nodding? And he said, yes. And the Buddha gave these means for working through uh, or away from that sloth and torpor. He said, if you are finding yourself drowsy, bring to mind uh, whatever you were attending to. Put that aside and bring to mind a different object. So this is where you put aside the breath, which can be, or the other object that's kind of bringing you sleepiness. And the breath is very relaxing, but if you're already tired, it can be uh, an issue to give too much attention to it. And you bring in a different object, often more active, like loving kindness, the perception of light, the preciousness of human rebirth, um, or the triple gem, this uh, recollection of the uh, path, the Dhamma, um, the Buddha, and the Sangha. He said, if that doesn't work, uh, pull on your earlobe. Oh, sorry, that comes later. Recite in your mind those words of Dhamma that you've learned and memorized. So this is where it's really useful to memorize uh, a chant, something that touches you. And it can be the loving kindness chant, the Karani and Metta Sutta is very common. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness, and so on. It's in this book. Or uh, another really powerful chant to memorize is the Dhamma Chaka Vavatana Sutta, the first discourse the Buddha gave. And the Buddha has said that, or uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi has said that of all the words given to the humanity, um, this was the, the wisest um, collection of words ever uttered. The discourse on the setting of motion of the wheel of Dhamma. So if you're going to spend time memorizing anything, um, why not that? And then if you are finding yourself tired or drowsy, review it in your, in your mind. If that doesn't work, he said that you could um, pull on your earlobes and rub your arms. So you'll see people doing this sometimes. Yeah, exactly, Sam. Pull on the earlobes and rub the arms up and down. If that doesn't work, he said, splash water on your face, cold water. Um, if that doesn't work, stand up and, uh, what is it? I believe establish the perception of light and then also walk back and forth, look up at the stars and do walking meditation. And often teachers in, uh, in the tradition will advise doing walking meditation backwards just to keep yourself on edge. I feel like that could go wrong, so use that with caution. And if that doesn't work, um, the Buddha says, lie down in lion's posture, which is the posture the Buddha passed away in, uh, which is sort of a, a reclining posture with one hand like this uh, on your side. It's, it's a somewhat delicate, balanced uh, posture. And go to sleep with the determination that as soon as I wake up, I will get up immediately not indulging in the pleasure of sleep. And I find that last one of a, what I call a, a micro nap actually is, is very useful. Sometimes your body just needs to kind of dip into that place where it's briefly shut off and restarts. And so often I'll let my, set my alarm for about seven minutes and just, if I really can't uh, wake myself up, just 
set the alarm for seven minutes, lie down, and then get up immediately as soon as the alarm goes off. And often then the mind will be ready to, to sit. Longporpasano would, uh, when he went to sleep, when he was the abbot of Nanachat, he would, uh, a monastery in Thailand, he would place cups of water all around his body and uh, so that if he moved too much, they would spill over and get him all wet. So that was his way of maintaining mindfulness uh, through his sleep. And there's also the story of a novice with Longpur Cha. Um, and Longpur Cha gave him instructions at the beginning, I think, of a rains retreat. And he said, see if you can remember if you woke up on an inhale or an exhale. And the novice, you know, really dedicated himself to this for, for months, really trying to develop mindfulness. And finally, a few weeks or months later, there was, he had another audience with Ajahn Chah, and he sort of prepared himself. He was all ready with his answer. And Ajahn Chah turned to him and said, um, so, novice, uh, what breath did you uh, fall asleep on? And the novice had all gotten all ready with the breath that he woke up on, but he'd completely missed what he fell asleep on. So this is a classic way Ajahn Shah taught his students. The final, and I think perhaps one of the most important ways, and you know, honestly, I think we'll just get through this hindrance today, is uh, to confront sloth and torpor is to, well, first, in one's life, to notice that stale quality beginning to pervade out. And David Stundel Rost said that the cure for tiredness is not rest, but wholeheartedness. And how, when we lack purpose, the channel and momentum of the heart and of our energy, because it finds nowhere completely worthy to go, tends to back up and clog the source and lead to this tepid and stale state. So, so much about bringing this brightness and aliveness to the heart in daily life is learning to align one's life more and more with the path and find roots for one's energy which are in line with, with this teaching. Um, learning to come to community as often as one can. Learning to give um, and really taking steps towards that. You know, signing up to work at soup kitchens or whatever particularly inspires one. Um, spending time at monasteries. Um, and just acknowledging that as we as much as we align our life with purpose, a vitality will enter into it. And that much of the staleness that creeps into our life and that feeling of being in a dungeon is from not having a root in the world worthy of all we sense in our hearts. And this same... Uh, ethic can apply to meditation to an extent in that often that stale, tepid pool um, of the mind needs to be stirred a bit. And the moss and algae which have accumulated over the top of it to be dissipated. And to uh, re-enter into this ethic of play and to do that, we need to, you know, play occurs when you have a set of rules, a game board, um, and creative ways of working with that. And the most available field of play we have in meditation is the body and that framework of the body, um, specifically approached through the uh, ethic of breath meditation, and not a simple breath meditation of just watching the breath at one point, um, right from the, the start, which is a 
too simple play chest to allow any real creativity. If all you can do is either be focused on your breath at your nose or not, you know, where does that leave you in terms of being able to work creatively with those energies? So this is why more and more teachers such as Ajahn Jeff, Ajahn Tamisaro, Ajahn Suchitto, Ajahn Jayasaro, um, really advise, and uh, Bhante Analio as well, and uh, attest to the fact that when the Buddha spoke about breath meditation, he was speaking about this full-bodied engagement with the breath energy. And this allows one to work actively moving one's awareness around the body. So uh, this can be the way of stirring that tepid pool of engaging with the mind and somatic energies and seeing how it feels. And that's interesting because interest is often the lacking quality. So the guided meditation this morning, um, which is called Method One, there's a book in the back called Keeping the Breath in Mind, translated by Ajahn Jeff, where it goes through Method One and Method Two. And these are just very simple ways of getting a feel for that game board or that field of play um, in different ways. So the first method one is establishing awareness at the tip of the nose, breathing in and out a few times, then moving it to the forehead, breathing in and out a few, a few times, then moving it back, and just do that seven times. And then from the forehead, come to the crown of the head, and imagine breathing in light down into the brain, and then come back to the forehead, and then the crown of the head seven times. And then from the crown of the head to the center of the brain, the pineal gland, and back and forth. And usually here you might notice a sort of bright light or nimitta, what we call a sign manifesting and growing in the mind. And you might notice uh, visions, um, intuitions, strange things kind of appearing. Don't get lost into them. And if it ever becomes too much, you can imagine inhaling the breath down into the heart and it'll all dissipate. But what you can do is allow that vision of light to stabilize and then very consciously bring it down to the chest and allow it to expand outward to the whole body, this wide field of bright awareness centered in the place where you feel the breath most prominently, such as the tip of the nose, but aware of the entire body, like a spider at the center of a web, but aware of the whole web. Um, and often that drop of awareness will help if you drop the chin a little bit. Um, if the chin's up, it'll keep the awareness up above the neck. So that's one way of kind of working with the playing field. And if, uh, if one feels kind of trapped in one's head and hasn't opened up the bottom of the body, this can be dangerous. And not dangerous, but it can lead to headaches. And if you have migraines a lot, you shouldn't use this right away. Instead, uh, you might use method two, which is where you imagine the breath as a light energy coming down through the base of the skull, um, down the spine and out one leg. And you don't have to do that with one breath, but you can do it over the course of several breaths. Just imagine this white light coursing down and out. And then again, down from the base of the skull, out the other leg. Then again, down the base of the skull and out over both arms and out the fingertips. Down the base of the throat to the belly. And then down in the chest to the dantian, the place above the navel. And then after you've done that, you expand awareness to that wide, bright field centered where you feel the breath most prominently. And both of those techniques are in a book called Keeping the Breath in Mind, which is in the back or online. Um, but the exact technique doesn't matter. Um, and Ajahn Jayasar gives a summarized version, which is dividing the body into three chambers and just putting awareness in the top chamber for a while, breathing, feeling its resonance, moving to the middle chamber uh, from about the neck to the belly button, breathing for a time, feeling its resonance, and then moving from the middle chamber to the bottom chamber, from the belly button to the feet or the tailbone, and breathing there for a time, feeling its resonance, and then expanding out to that wide awareness. So you'll notice in every case, the goal and the end point is that wide, broad awareness. But these are just different ways of kind of running around the body in the meantime to get a feel for for this whole field of play. And you learn that um, there are just really fun ways of working with the hindrances hidden in that field. Um, if you're tired and you put awareness up in the top of the body, it's a very bright place. 
if you're agitated and you put awareness sort of in the bottom chamber, it's a very grounded and settled area. Um, but more than anything, it's engaging, it's interesting, and it's playful. And it's uh, basically vitaka vichara, directed thought and evaluation, is what that is, is you're directing the mind with these visualizations. And that's vitaka, which is the antidote to sloth and torpor. And vichara is seeing what happens. It's like vitaka is you making your move on the game board. Vichara is seeing what happens, what the uh, opponent does. And um, that's a fun way of working with meditation. And I think that uh, engaged, playful ethic works in terms of confronting all five hindrances, but certainly uh, it's effective in working with this third of kinamita or sloth and torpor. So best of luck to everyone. Sadhu, 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 Anumodhani. So that was a bit. Um, I think we have a mic. Do we have a floating mic today? So if people want to raise their hand to ask a question or speak about anything, and if you're on YouTube, you can type in questions to chat. If you're on Zoom, you can either type a question into, into chat or raise your electronic hand and we'll be able to call on you. And if you, uh, great, so you can bring it over there and just say your name and hold the mic close to your face Testing. or your mouth. Testing. My name is Christina. And I was wondering if I can apply walking meditation towards running. Like, can I, could it work at all? And if not, why? Like, what's the difference? Thank you. I find it's really useful to think of practice as, as a tiered system. And you have your really course levels when you have a lot of energy in the body and mind where practice will be really active and um, robust. So, uh, you know, the fourth enlightenment factor is tranquility of body and mind and making the body feel good is, is huge. Uh, if you haven't gotten, you know, if you're used to exercising and you haven't gone for the run, then meditation often, at least for me or people I know who are athletes, you know, will feel hot and claustrophobic and just won't go anywhere. I don't know if that's your experience at all. Um, so if that's the case, then there's a place for running before, before the act of meditating um, to establish that tranquility of, of mind, pasadi, and body. Um, you know, and as mindful as you can make that running wonderful, you know, if, if you can really maintain a clear awareness or you know, uh, spread loving kindness to each person you come across. Uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi does that in airports as you come up with a particular metta wish for each person you see. So I think you could do that while jogging. But there is a certain restraint and refinement to walking meditation where, you know, you, you clasp hands in front of the body uh, behind the body is a little too casual, so this maintains a certain degree of decorum, decorum. And, you know, you set that pathway of 20 paces or 25 paces, and you, you reestablish mindfulness at the middle and at each end um, as you turn around. And, and it just has more ability to really sink into a, a very calm place. But I think that uh, you can work with running first to get out that energy. And you might find that's actually the more effective way for you is running until the body is really tired and then sitting and you'll be calm. You know, there, there are two ways of calm, too calm. One is I can tell you to relax. The other is uh, you can do pull-ups until you're so exhausted you collapse and you'll be pretty relaxed then. That latter one's often been my approach, so.
I've had trouble with um, walking meditation in terms of like being able to settle on one object of meditation. And so I have a hard time focusing my mindfulness on like one exact thing um, within like that act of walking. Um, is there like any particular like area that I should focus on my mindfulness or mm. um, should it be a more like lantern awareness? First, it's not unusual to have difficulty really coming to calm with walking, you know. But the Buddha did say one of the benefits of walking meditation is that when you do get to calm, it lasts much longer. And you also get the ability to kind of click into it um, whenever you begin to walk somewhere, which is really useful. I would say one useful recollection is instead of conceiving awareness as encapsulated in the body, kind of moving with you down the walking trail to imagine the body as encapsulated in awareness itself, you know, and you're just, you're not moving really in terms of awareness. Awareness is wide and you're just walking in the midst of awareness. The other approach is to, you know, keep this full body breath um, flow meditation and awareness going and, and that will be more diffuse, but even there, usually you'll want to maintain some sort of center at the nose or the belly where you're sort of more centered. But often with a, a motion as coarse as walking as opposed to sitting, I also find I kind of have to pair it with a similarly robust meditation. Um, it's a bit like trying to pair, I was going to say wine, like good grape juice with like... Um, <laughs> you know, a, a dish is you don't want a really strong grape juice with your <laughs> vegan steak. You want um, something that pairs well. So often I'll use, uh, I find walking meditation, if you use that time to memorize or go over a chant, it's kind of that pull up until you're exhausted approach for me is, is really going over a chant and really engaging the mind. And somehow that pairs well with the act of walking. But you may find that as you've done that, you, you really come to a point where you just stop and you can't walk anymore. You, like your mind suddenly becomes very calm and you just have to stop and stand there and then you just sit. Um, but yeah, I usually have to use an active object like memorizing a chant or using a chant. And that's completely valid. It can be a really effective technique. So Budo is a pretty popular mantra recommended by many Ajans. And um, I was wondering, well, sometimes I use other words like, you know, patience or Kanti, the Pali word for that, or metta, and I'll just repeat those in my mind. Um, but I was curious if there are any other mantras that you have heard recommended or that you recommend or um, don't recommend. <laughs> um, you know, one that I've heard Ajahn Anand talk about is uh, the ETP so, but I don't know if that really counts as a mantra because I I think that's quite long, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think I'm thinking a little shorter, um, you know, maybe a few words um, mm -hmm. that you can repeat over and over. Because, yeah, when I first heard about ETP so, I was like, oh, that's really short. That's just like two words. And then I looked it up and it's like, oh, it's a whole chant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's like, do it 108 times. And I'm like, it takes like a minute to get through it. It's <laughs> like a two hour thing. So. Anyways, I was just curious if you had some mantras that you could recommend. The There's a, a story of uh, Long Tom Mahabua um, reciting Budo until Basically, Ajahn Mun tells him to get to Samadhi. He has to recite it for six days or so nonstop until he drops into concentration. And I, I know we've talked about this before, and a lot of monastics, when they hear that, will 
be like, all right, that's what I'm doing, and, and just recite Buddha to yourself for, for a few days. And uh, honestly, I've, most of the monastics I've seen who've tried this have just been miserable after about two days. It just gets really intense. Um, so, yeah, I find holding it delicately, and there's going to be times where your mind just doesn't want the mantra anymore, and that's okay. Um, I find the sound of silence can be a helpful stand-in for a mantra sometimes. This subtle ringing below the auditory landscape. And if others are interested in that, um, there's a PDF online called Inner Listening by Ajahn Amaro, which is about, it's very short, but it goes into how to hear this subtle ringing or hissing below the auditory landscape. Uh, and you can usually pick it out by putting in earplugs or when you're calm. But if you really give it attention, it can become very prominent in your mental landscape. And it's, you know, Long Force Sameda's main object. It's, it's really powerful and it pairs well with the breath. I find that can be a useful, using mantra until the sound of silence becomes available can be helpful because the sound of silence, it's, moderns tend to overdo things. We love to do our, you know, try to do ourselves in a meditation or calm and it just doesn't work. So, I find the sound of silence can be a helpful stepping stone from like an active object to something that's actually slightly receptive. Um, so that's a good intermediary, I find. The other mantras, uh, you know, Budang Saranam Gachami, Dhammang Saranam Gachami, Sangang Saranam Gachami, to the Buddha I go for refuge, to the Dhamma I go for refuge, to the Sangha I go for refuge. That's fairly simple and powerful. Uh, it helps if you have a little mantra sometimes or a mala to use bead by bead. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I just find um, I, I've really heard teachers be very broad with what you can use that's effective. Like some people use love, um, yeah, and, and, and the like. But uh, I do find that for most people, it's hard to make your single meditation object a mantra with nothing else because... It, it is kind of a, a one-trick pony to some extent, or, or like it comes to a point where you just can't keep doing it, and having the breath as a basis is helpful. Yeah. Uh, my name is Scott. Um, so last week I was talking to some folks going to India, and they were talking about um, one of the monks who sees everybody as a corpse which is unnerving, um, <laughs> but interesting. And I thought to myself, it must be along the lines of uh, impermanence. And um, is, is that kind of what he's talking about? Kind of. It's, it's a longer answer, but I don't know if this is an intermediary question and part of a longer question. Yeah, it's part of... So I was just wondering if, if it is... How, how does that serve us to see other people as corpses? Because I that would just doesn't sound very nice <laughs> and on top of that it how it, it seems like it's like the cup is already broken i i don't really understand this idea because it takes me away from the cup that's here now mm. how is that being here now if i'm thinking of it being gone someday mm. thank you That's another mantra I forgot is bones or uh, corpse or blood. Those all work, actually. <laughs> yeah, good, good question. I have, a, I have a talk several weeks back called Body Contemplation. Um, and there's, that, that might be useful because it's a bigger subject. But, uh, you know, first with the Ajahn Shah quote that the cup is already broken, you know, an impermanence is, if used correctly, that contemplation of impermanence or, or death um, should bring one right into the moment. In the sense, you know, when the Buddha teaches death contemplation, he says, how often, bhikkhus, do you contemplate death? And one says, every seven days, I think how lucky I am I have this week to practice the teachings. And he says, you are careless. And so on, so forth, through swallowing, a mouthful of food to the monk who actually is acknowledged as heedful is the one who thinks with every in-breath how lucky I am to have this long to practice the teaching. And then with every out-breath thinks how, how lucky I am to have this long to pra practice the teaching. And 
actually the only place in the suttas the Buddha speaks about the present in, in this like remaining in the present is in the context of death contemplation because it it just snaps you right here um, and it also you know separates the chafe from the uh, chaff or the chafe chaff thank you okay um, the chaff from the grain you know where it's like it's hard to get angry at your partner for not doing the dishes if you're you know you both might die in a few minutes you know and there's it's a beauty in that and also separates the trivial from the non-trivial so so if if it's just bringing up worry and fear, then, then don't use it. You know, like the Buddha gave so many skillful means and sometimes you have to focus on loving kindness and sometimes you've got to remember that what we usually go to for refuge is not worthy of, of our hearts. Um, but, uh, so yeah, especially like an aversive type uh, character, um, if they found it was bringing up worry or something, then then it's not, there shouldn't be their main object, but if it brings about this um, this feeling of like I need to use this time very well right now, and the career I'm pursuing, the things I'm giving my time to are not worthy of me, considering that I will die. That's correct. Um, and if you can't stay with the breath and you find proliferation moving out, um, the death contemplation can be a really effective sword just to cut. Like, I will die, life is uncertain, death is certain. The, uh, and there's gratitude hidden there, I find. Body contemplation, it's related to impermanence, but it's its, it's own thing. Um, and it's not talked about in the West often, because it's much more, it's much safer to talk about loving kindness than to talk, tell people to contemplate their kidneys. Um, but it is, if you read the suttas, especially the verses of the elder nuns and monks, the Tarigata and the Tarigata, you see that most of, a huge percentage of their initial breakthroughs to a stage of awakening was predicated on seeing through the body. And it's strange because our delusion about the body is so deep that we don't know we're deluded. Um, and you get little hints of it though, like if a hair drops into your soup, how suddenly the soup is disgusting. But like, it's just right there, like what's different, you know? Um, so, th so we're missing something and we kind of know, but I find for people to really have insight into that, what you have to do with body contemplation, and it's talked about all the time in um, Thailand. In fact, it's the first meditation we're given as monastics before breath meditation even, is you wait until the mind is calm and bright and after it's rested for a while, it'll start to move again. It's like the cup of samadhi is full. And then you apply it to contemplating the body. Specifically, honestly, the bones are almost universally a worthy object for people. Um, and you just have, when the mind is calm and powerful, you can kind of look at the, the body and see that it's not you. A and it's 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 really profound and um, it's hard to explain because it's so simple in a way, but it's not the same as negative body image because negative body image is comparing your own body to other bodies. This is just seeing all bodies as these kind of weird things that do their best. Like they're complex and beautiful in a natural sense, but but they're not beautiful like we think they are uh, in in that particular way. And I found it a backdoor to meta because we judge people so much by their bodies. Like if they're attractive, then immediately, you know, they're attractive. And if they're unattractive, then there's this dismissal. If they're old, then there's just so much baggage. And just to be able to put down that side of someone and just be, to be able to start to see their spirit shine through their chitta is such a gift. And, um, and as you do body contemplation, you do begin to see people shining through that veil a little bit more and more. Um, so anyways, it's safer for greed types to use body contemplation than aversion types. If you find yourself getting really grumpy about two days after you do it, then you'll know it's probably not your proper contemplation. But especially if you're a greed type, it's very safe to do. And it's, it, it should bring a, a feeling of coolness and, and settledness and brightness. Yeah, sorry. <laughs>